So Yishai, it's a real pleasure to sit down with you in my library. How are you doing? Great. I was good. And uh, I just want to remember for a second how we met. And so before I tell my story, why don't you t tell your story of how we met? Uh, I think we met three or four years ago uh, after a lecture by uh, Hillel Noel from... Uh, UN Watch. UN Watch. We met in the lobby after Hillel's speech, and we had a very interesting conversation about Israel and Siegfried Krakauer. Yeah, so I there recall. we go. And just for your, the listener's interest, I don't spend my life reading Siegfried Krakauer, but a friend here in Zurich sent me a copy of a biography of his by a professor called Jörg Später. And the great interest for me was that Jörg Später writes about my grandfather. So there I am. Uh, I meet Yishai. I hear Yishai is a film critic. And I say, oh, film critic. So Siegfried Krakauer is uh, famous for having been a theoretician of movies. And I say, do you know who Siegfried Krakauer is? And Yishai says, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was amazing for me because I exist in a world of finance and uh, as anybody's read my book knows that uh, life just spent in finance is not a complete life and so that was interesting to me and I don't know many people maybe you shy how many people do you know who've read Siegfried Krakauer yeah, just the people who were with me at, at university more or less so in any case you shy was the first but then the other thing that surprised me so uh uh, in my world, Yishai, uh, we have a hero. His name is Charlie Munger. And he's been asked, do you read any fiction? And Charlie Munger said, no, not really anymore. And I didn't, I, I, there's many things I revere about Charlie Munger, but that's not one of them. Because somewhere in my education, I feel like one should read the classics. And I don't feel like I've read enough of them. So the next sort of thing that surprised me about Yishai is that I think at the time I either had just read or was trying to read Ulysses by James Joyce. And so I asked you, Shai, have you read James Joyce's Ulysses? Yeah, and I, and I had actually. But again, this, this goes back to, to just wanting to study uh, all these uh, monumental uh, works uh, of fiction as part of uh, me wanting to be a writer, me uh, trying to figure out uh, what can be done, what has been done, and just kind of seeing this whole uh, body of work as, you know, something that I should try at least to, to go through and to, to kind of get my, my impression of. So I, I would just tell you from my perspective, Yishai, other than watching a video of Stephen Fry talking about reading James Joyce's Ulysses, I don't think I've met anybody else who's read it. Yeah. <laughs> so at least somebody who A, has, can claim to have read it, and the other thing that you did with me was that you were approving. <laughs> so, so you thought that that was a good thing. So you just told me that you were reading James Joyce's Ulysses because you wanted to see what's out there. You wanted to know what the landscape of literature looks like. Yeah. Because you are a writer, yeah. unlike, well, I guess I have written a book, but I don't consider myself a writer as such. So for somebody like me, or somebody who perhaps comes to you and says, well, I haven't read James Joyce's Ulysses, and why the hell should I? Who doesn't aspire to become a writer? And I, I want to take one answer away from you before I do that, because I know, I know we're going to come to another place. We're going to talk about your reading Stephen King. <laughs> but before we get there, why should somebody read Ulysses from your perspective? Well, I don't think that everyone should read Ulysses, uh, and I don't think that uh, one should force himself to read something that he isn't interested in or doesn't like have this kind of natural inclination towards. But I think, first of all, beyond just the, the sheer pleasure of, of language and of what can be achieved in writing, that, that it's just a monumental uh, example of just, just art, you know? It's something that the minute you find your bearings inside one of these huge chapters, uh, like, it's like a labyrinth. Uh, I think that what you can take away is invaluable. 
as as a reader, as an as like the aesthetic experience to be gained from from such uh, an effort. Uh, of course, it requires effort, but I, I I fully think that it's worth it. And the deeper you get into it, the more you you try to understand. Of course, there are all these books about Ulysses and all these kind of uh, breakdowns of each chapter, and you really need these kind of. Uh, guides to find your way through but I think it's an amazing experience to kind of master it to kind of understand that you're understanding what he was trying to say Joyce I was telling you before we started this conversation for the listener that the first time I I haven't smoked pot many times but the first time I did it was in Amsterdam I was about 25 years old with a group of friends and just to rewind a little bit and I'm curious to get your commentary so what I decided was one way or another, I don't know what's in them, but I don't want to die without having read at least a few of them. And so I set as, for myself as a goal to have done that. And the other thing that I realized was that for me, there are some things that I really enjoy reading and are fun to read. You know, take you know, s- summarize it under the title of The Economist. You know, that is just, uh, and, and many other kinds of works of nonfiction, which are kind of maybe in the self-help genre because I get the seeker in me gets super excited that I might learn something about how to live a better life. And what I realized was that when you have a book like Ulysses, is the one that we brought up, the analogy that I have in my mind is that I like walking. I don't want to climb a mountain every single day. Even climbing the Utliberg, which is a small mountain, is a significant effort. And reading a book like Ulysses is a bit like climbing a mountain. And that sometimes the view is going to be beautiful, sometimes it's going to be tough going. But do you think that people who've read Ulysses are better human beings on the other side? Of course not. I don't think that has anything to do with... Able to live, perceive life better? It really depends what you're trying to get out of it. I mean, when you said before that I'm a writer, I don't write fiction. I write uh, songs. I write uh, pop songs or rock songs or lyrics. It's something that I've uh, been doing for, for quite a while. And for me, Ulysses, you brought up the, the example. I mean, if I would just walk around at a party and say, hey, I read Ulysses, then, you know, I'd be like this fart uh, right. showing off. But for me, Joyce in general and, and, and Ulysses is just, this is what can be done with language. This is what can be done with the English language. This is what can be done in, in a novel, in novel form. And if words are your game, like I know that you have numbers are your game, but words for me, for always were my game, like as I was looking at what I wanted to do with myself. And that's why I went to uh, study English literature, because for me, each one of these classic books is like a building block. And if you put them all together, then you can build this, this huge building and you can kind of understand what what holds it all together and how it so, all goes together do you think the mountain analogy so you know you know let's say that ulysses is the matterhorn and then maybe another classic book is the mont blanc and uh, and you know that you know you live in that landscape so you want to know what the matterhorn looks like you want to have climbed it once at least and the same in mont blanc is a different mountain then you have everest as yet another mountain would is that a good analogy i, th- I think each each one of these uh, masterworks or even not they don't all have to be masterworks but i think each one is more is closer to a rock than than a mountain and of course there are bigger rocks and smaller rocks and there there are parts that, that will be harder to climb but i think they all make up the mountain when you put them together in a right. way before we move on to movies, which is more your area of specialty. Yeah. So the listener should know that when I told Yishai <laughs> that I was going to start off talking about the classic Yishai's words to me were, me, now, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> so I brought up Ulysses, but to somebody like me who lives in a world more of numbers, if I just were to say, Yishai, what, you know, what are the most important rocks uh, that are books? Uh, which, which kind of like just off the top of your head, which are the rocks that you'd want me to pick up? In literature? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> just five, you know, standing oh, on one man. leg in three minutes. Well, oh. that's too tough. <laughs> that's too tough. Uh, let's, let's come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Ulysses is in there. Probably, yeah. Is... Um, 
Uh, so, you know, the, the one that I'm reading now, Magic Mountain. Yeah, but that's, that's the first thing I'm thinking about. Are we talking about English language or just like in all languages? Or? In, all, in all languages. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. I'm not qualified to give I, like the top five well, no, you are qualified things, to give your, to read. your opinion of the top five. Yeah, but it changes all the time. And it really depends like where you are in life. And like maybe like the, the top five books I've read last year. <laughs> well, which of those? Oh, that's, <laughs> that's tough. We should get on to Stephen King. So why do you make your point now? Because you've said it to me. Tell, make your point about Stephen King. Now, you were asking me, I mean, this, this came up like as, in a response to you. You were asking me if one should read the classics. And I mean, it's not like, I don't think it's a clear cut answer to that. Like, yeah, one should. I mean, you have to read the classics. I don't think you have to do anything. I mean, if, if it interests you, then of course, please do. But uh, there's also this kind of uh, hierarchy within literature between high and low and what's considered, you know, good for you or what's like a guilty pleasure or whatever. So I just mentioned Stephen King as someone that I, I started reading only recently. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of came up with this kind of, this whole underlying logic that, you know, as long as it's a, it's a captivating story told in an interesting way and it makes me want to keep on reading, then, you know, the the book is good, you know, it's doing its job. And the same applies for, for movies as well. I mean, there are art house classics and whatever that everyone will, can talk for hours about how amazing and moving they are. And they're also just like stupid action movies with uh, exploding uh, buildings and Schwarzeneggers walking around, you know, not turning their, their heads when things blow up uh, behind them. And, you know, they also have their, their value and they also can be the best of their kind, you know, so it's like we should really assess these things, you know, separately. They, one doesn't take away from the other in, in a way. Yeah, I, I don't want to be a, a, a snob, a cultural snob. Neither do I. <laughs> I, I noticed and you're, you're potentially more in danger of that because you're a film critic. Yeah. But I do want to say that I don't think that I'm all that much wiser for having read my way through Ulysses which I was in the middle of saying that I kind of did not force myself to try and understand every word and every page. And so I kind of imagined that I was a little bit high at times and I was just sort of like floating across the landscape. But I do think that my reading uh, War and Peace really did give me wisdom that I didn't have. And I'm right now, I'm watching a lot of lectures of Jordan Peterson and he taught, he says that way better than Leo Tolstoy for him is Dostoevsky, and I read Dostoevsky, but I probably didn't understand it. In any case, I do think that I'm a better person for having read the classics, and I know that there's a kind of a, if you say it, you're, you're fearful of being a snob, perhaps, cultural snob, but I think that. So let's go on to movies. And I think that, you know, if we take Ulysses, well, the original Ulysses by um, the Greek poet whose name... Homer. There we go. That was an oral classic, became a written classic. James Joyce talks about, you know, he took the name from that classic. And, you know, we then got into radio and movies. And I guess movies are rooted in the tradition that I just described, presumably. Stories. Stories. And by the way, you, you said something that I'm going to disagree with. I mean, I... <laughs> I, I, I my son likes watches, watching movies with people exploding, mm -hmm. and, and, they, and I love the way you say, and they don't even look to see the explosion, which is obviously so unrealistic. And you know, don't tell me you like that. Of course you don't like that. I love them. <laughs> so If they're well made and they're exciting and they're, I mean, it helps if they're original and they show me something I haven't seen or they show me something that I have seen, but it's, it's, it's well made and... Why not? I mean, so, so I'm going to name a movie that you certainly we didn't bring up, and I only watched. It could it. also be more than fun. Sorry. More than fun. It, so it, could, it can be. Yeah, it has so the potential. Star Wars is more than fun because it's archetypal in so many different ways, and there's okay. so many archetypal scenes. But I'll just give you one. Do you know the movie Tenet? Of course. <laughs> so I watched Tenet, and I, I, my wife and I took our son to watch Tenet. In a movie theater. In a movie theater. Okay. Yeah. So he was so happy. Yeah. And I could not get the logic of the forward backwards. My son has tried 
10 times to tell me and I get a headache after the first sentence. I understand. How about you? Understandable. First of all, are you a Christopher Nolan fan? Do you know his, his other movies? You know, I... Um, Memento, Inception... Oh, that's amazing. So Memento Dunkirk. with Guy, with Guy Pearce? Yeah, that's his second movie, but his first, uh, his first hit, his first movie. I, I forced my children to watch Memento. They hated it. Really? Uh, but I told them that to watch Memento is a insight into my mind as an ADHD guy. That's really interesting. And, I, and it's, a, it's a tragic movie. Tragic, yeah, tragic. It uh, and it's I, fascinating. And I have watched Inception. And I, I thought Inception was fantastic. I've watched it twice. But Tenet lost me. But you can see the connection between Tenet, Inception, and Memento. Memento is like a mini version of Tenet. It's like this whole going backwards in time. He starts the story at the end. He has another timeline in the middle. So Tenet is like this huge... Well, look, we can try to explain it, but more important than that, I mean, it offers this overwhelming experience. I don't think Tenet is one of Christopher Nolan's better movies. I mean, maybe it's his most ambitious, his most, uh, I don't know, his biggest, craziest, whatever to date, but I don't think it's his best. I don't think he's... Which is his best? I really like Inception. I like Prestige. If you if you've seen it with the two dueling magicians, I haven't seen Prestige. Um, I pretty much like almost all his movies, uh, but I think those two are probably the ones that I like the best. I really enjoyed Tenet, but uh, I more enjoyed it like as this kind of abstract Hollywood blockbuster that you kind of can't really find your you know, your bearings while you're watching right. it. I'm sure, I have no doubt in my mind that if you put it on, down on paper and you try to figure out, like you try to decipher the movie, it's going to work 100%. I mean, I'm sure that for, for Nolan, everything makes sense. So, you know, interestingly enough, you have, you have Hollywood blockbusters where they don't even try to make it fit together. Mm -hmm. But what you're telling me is that Christopher Nolan is a bright guy and he, there's a logic behind the movie that... Always. All his movies. All his movies are like uh, these Swiss watches. Everything falls into place. And that's his brand. I mean, he doesn't make uh, mindless entertainment. You can say he makes <laughs> too much minded entertainment. You know, you can say it's like, who cares? You know, just get to the point already. You know, I mean, Tenet was in a way a kind of a, a turning point for him because I think it was... It's not his fault that the movie was a box office disappointment or whatever because movie theaters all over the world were closed last year so it couldn't perform as it was uh, expected to perform financially. But I think uh, critically it was his first movie that kind of didn't uh, have a unanimous glowing reception where people were, were like, okay, we've already seen this done better from you in the past. And you're kind of repeating yourself. But uh, I, I kind of enjoy uh, trying to keep up with a movie. Not, not if a movie is constantly telling me that it's smarter than me. I don't enjoy that. Are there movies like that? Of course. Tell me, are there any that I've watched? Uh, let me think about it for a minute, yeah. for, uh, for a good example. But uh, I, never kind of, I never saw Christopher Nolan as that kind of director. I know that there are some people who see him as that kind of director like always trying to prove that he's uh, smarter than in his audience. But I think that if his audience can't keep up with him, then, you know, he's kind of, it's, it's a pointless game because right. you have to have that point where, you know, it sinks in and you understand. And like watching, I, I was watching uh, The Prestige with my, my son, uh, who's nine, and just looking at his face at the last two, three minutes of, of the movie where everything falls together and I could just see his, his mind, like his, his brain exploding. Like, oh, oh my God. He's like, you can really see like the gears working and like, and that's, that's like a magic trick unto itself, like to, to play your, your viewer like a fiddle, you know, and to bring him to the finish line and, and just then reveal like your, your true intent and, to have these twists come in one after the other like over like two or three minutes and just totally change your perception of the movie. I think that's incredible. The one time that that's happened to me 
and I'm gonna I hope that I remember enough of the movie for you to find out what I'm talking about and then uh, identify is the man who's a castaway on a boat and on the boat there is also a tiger yeah that's the life of Pi yeah and and you know there I am and it's only at the very end of the movie yeah. and by the way sp plot spoiler here if you haven't watched it <laughs> That I realized that those those are elements of his own own mind, yeah. and and that it, there was cannibalism taking place, yeah. and that it was an extraordinarily tragic moment yeah. or tragic movie, yeah. and uh, that really touched me. I have to say that touched me. That was that was one of the moments in cinema for me, which was kind of beautiful and tragic at the same time. Which I think that you seem to experience those moments far more frequently than I do, because you spend more time studying and watching it. And I, I, you know, and the, for the listener, this is unprepared as well. There's another director that I paid some attention to that I know, I'm certain you know him. Is is it David Lynch? Yeah. So Blue Velvet. One and, of my favorites. One of my and, favorite directors. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all. And because that's, yeah, I, I even I can appreciate that that's art and it tells a, a, a story that's at once and I'm thinking of a movie with Isabel, with him in it, with there's Chris Isaac for Isabel yeah. Rossellini, Laura It's Dunn. wild at heart. That movie went deep into my soul for reasons that I could probably sit and talk to a psychotherapist about and I still don't fully understand. And it is a dark movie. <laughs> Very dark, yeah, but also amazing. You know that I think that that was a time when I used to, and, I, and we're going to get on to the impact of Netflix and the streaming services, but that was a time uh, when I would go and rent the movies at Blockbuster or mm -hmm. somewhere like that. But be, so, so just to step back a second, what people like me know in general are classics, are movies that I brought up to you before, uh, uh, like Casablanca, The Godfather, Star Wars. I think that what you would say is that they're both classics and popular or maybe classics but popular and i guess in the conversation we had before this i brought up the godfather and you instantly responded saying well there's the godfather but have you watched and you named two or three me movies that i've never heard of mm -hmm. so for somebody who somebody like me who hasn't watched those movies tell me sort of give me a sense of what i'm missing i guess uh, that depends how, how you look at it. I mean, um, again, I don't think everybody should read the classics, and I don't think everybody needs to watch the classics. I think, uh, in a way, there is very much an importance and, and a value to knowing how we got to where we are and what came before and what led to what. You know, when Star Wars came out, uh, there were critics who, who wrote that this is the end of cinema as we know it. And in a way, they were also right in assuming, you know, that, that this is the beginning of the end, this, this huge blockbuster that kind of uh, eclipses everything else and just plays for years and years and then spawns endless, uh, an endless number of sequels and spin-offs and imitations and, you know, just completely changes the landscape of, of movies forever. Uh, and the same uh, for The Godfather as well, which also was a huge, huge hit when it came out and was also based on a best-selling book. The thing is that the minute you, you get the idea that there's only one type of, of entertainment or only one type of experience, I think that's what's sad. Like for me, as, as a film critic or as a film lover, just a, a person who's always waiting for the next big experience you know, to hit, and the minute things become, you know, you, you start seeing things only through one lens, like Godfather, Star Wars, or whatever, you don't kind of see other possibilities. I think that's where we start missing out, and where uh, I think also there's a risk of the art form just diminishing and just not, not producing uh, works at the level that, that you know, that, that is desired by, by people like myself. So if, if we just stick with The Godfather for a bit. So first of all, in The Godfather, there I realized only recently that there are so many scenes that are archetypal scenes. So mm -hmm. for example, there's the, the father dancing with the daughter at the wedding at the beginning. Yeah. And that's an archetypal scene. And there's 
there's scenes where the son wants to run away from the family business and ends up being drawn into the family business. And, and so those are, those are archetypal that I realize are kind of like, I realize that actually my life, you know, I'll be living some part of my life where I'm thinking through my relationship with my father. And then I realize that that movie has influenced the way I think about it or that uh, the situation with uh, what is what is the boy who takes over the business called? I don't remember. Michael. Mikey, of course. Who can forget Mikey? You know, and that his relationship with his father and his first of all, there's Sonny, and he wants to go somewhere else. He doesn't want to be in the business. He he's too temperamental. Sonny, yeah. yeah but there, so so there are that that is the story of so many families, and that's part of what makes that movie a classic. But another part that is sort of. I don't know, there's a word, but I don't have it. The hero of the movie is actually engaging in unspeakable evil. So, you know, if we take Mike and his dad, they're running a criminal enterprise. They're signing off on the murder of people. Mm -hmm. and, and there's this lurid fascination with myself and I guess with every viewer that I want them to succeed. But how can I want them to succeed? You want them to fail. They're they're breaking the law. They're 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 engaging in corruption. And is that the first time that uh, that's not the first time? Of course not. The gangster movies in the thirties. Same thing. Yeah. And, and the, the, anti heroes, it, and also uh, anti hero. There we and go. And also the the whole uh, lure of being an outlaw and being like. You want the outlaw being, to succeed. Well, even. it depends. Not, not at all costs. We also, I mean, there are many experiments, interesting experiments, where you kind of try to show how far will audience identification go. I mean, how, how far will it, will it go? How like, evil do they have to be? Exactly. I mean... Uh, but these outlaw heroes always have these redeeming qualities, like... Like, um, the Sometimes. Godfather is a... Yeah, I mean, when, when Michael uh, has his uh, brother killed... In, in The Godfather Part Two, I mean, I think that's kind of a, a point where you don't like him so much after that. Yeah. Like when you kind of see how far he's going to go. I mean, yeah, he had to do it or whatever, but... But yeah. that's part of the, what makes the movie a great movie because you go away having It's opera. Struggle. I mean, that's... When you ask me, like, what does it... What can you get from... I mean, from knowing where things come from. The Godfather is opera. I mean, it was constructed like an opera. All the big set pieces at the end of each movie are play around some huge uh, opera number and it's built in such a way that you know the the emotions are, are bigger than life and uh, I mean this whole story is, is it's not about a family you know it's like a, it's about America it's about the American dream it's about like I'm sure you're familiar with the sopranos which is just another kind of version you know of the same kind of the family that does what it has to do to to survive and to thrive and to and that, that, to uh, eat the competition and it's to a, uphold its values and you know it's a great segue into the world of Netflix <laughs> and uh, because you're right the Godfather was on HBO and he I mean it, you know you could not well, you understand the Godfather much better if you watch sorry you understand the Sopranos mm -hmm. much better if you watch the Godfather and if I think of some of the things that we talked about discussing so um sons of anarchy and queen of the south they're also similar kinds of heroes to mikey they have these re amazing redeeming qualities but at the end of the day they're engaged in a criminal enterprise mm -hmm. and you want them to succeed so let's just dive straight into it we started off with classic movies like the godfather and i realized that that's kind of popular classic and that turned into Sopranos, and that turned into Sons of Anarchy. And I was at home alone because my wife was in London, and I tuned back into Sons of Anarchy. And it's like there's endless hours of Sons of Anarchy. And it seems to me that a common denominator with Sons of Anarchy and Queen of the South in pretty much every episode is that they set up the awful act that somebody did to our hero. And the agreement with the audience is, don't worry, by the end, your hero is going to get his or her revenge, but with a twist that makes you want to watch the next one. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's a little formulaic, actually. But the interesting thing is that I start to realize the formula. And I also realize that if I want to rewatch The Godfather, I can dive into the scenes and kind of enjoy them again for a second time. Because if I rewatch Sons of Anarchy, 
I don't even remember the plot line, and it's not that interesting to dive into the scenes. So there's something like it's it's a very very different kind of substance. It's functional. So what has happened? Tell tell up. I want to hear in your own words what I'm reaching for. I don't think it's something that happened. I think it it depends on the show you're watching. And uh, The Sopranos, I think, is is not an average show. It kind of became bigger than just a TV show. And uh, on that same level, I can also talk about uh, The Wire, if you're familiar with the TV show. The Wire was also on HBO, a show by David Simon, and also connects us with literature because it's very much uh, modeled after uh, Dickens, uh, Dickens novels. And it's about uh, Baltimore. It, it shows the criminal side. It shows the law and order side and how they correspond, and it has like, I don't know, maybe 30 different characters. And this is a show that I can watch, like every year or so I watch it again. It's five seasons, and I, I just enjoy watching the whole thing again. So that, for example, is, is what TV can do. Like if we talked before about Ulysses and what literature can do, then this is what, what a TV show can do, you know, if so inclined and you know if you have this genius uh, writer who brings all these other geniuses around him and they work together for a few years and they get creative freedom to do whatever they want and it was never a, a high rated show the ratings were never high but uh, it managed to to stick around for enough time to to produce five seasons and i mean today it's considered i think uh, as one of the greatest tv shows ever and it, no disrespect to Sons of Anarchy, but it's just like on a different level. I mean, also, um, the goals are different. You know, you're not so, trying to, to just get someone to watch the next episode. You're trying to tell the story as best as you can. You don't, you're also not concerned with ratings necessarily. Yeah. So why, why have I, I mean, I want to believe that I care about quality. I want to believe that I'm interested, but I've never heard of The Wire. Why is that? First of all, it isn't as popular as other shows uh, still, even though it has this kind of mythological uh, standing. Um, but uh, no worries. I mean, I can, I can hook you up <laughs> well, with, with my to, box set. Yeah, I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. But um, I think that, I guess, it's, it, I'm try, I've been trying to educate uh, my wife on this, which is that if you open up even before streaming services, I don't know what the algorithm is that puts up what they put up, but they're not, they're going to put up something in general. Don't rely on their algorithm to choose what you watch. And I tried to convince, so, you know, we, I told Yushai the story of how we ended up during lockdown watching Rashomon, which has now become a huge event in my family because I made myself very unpopular by forcing all of my family to read through, to watch through it. And what did I do? I looked at the 100 greatest movies that you have to watch before you die. And I think that using that as an, a heuristic is a good heuristic because I cannot watch everything. But it's kind of frustrating for me that there's a show that you say is a fantastic TV show and I have not even heard of it. I think it's great because it just shows you that you're nowhere near being through with going over everything that's worth watching or reading or or whatever you know i mean the same with rashomon i mean if you go through the one the list of 100 movies you need to see before you die and you watch four of them and three are boring but the fourth one is amazing then you go down that rabbit hole yep. then you go movies that are similar to to that movie and yep. then you go down and another world opens up to you so I think that this is what's amazing about living in these times is that everything is available to us. Like we used to have to go to a library or a blockbuster or whatever. We, we have these libraries at, at our fingertips now. I'll tell you something that I realize now is really, really important. And I'm realizing it and I'm going to share it with you. And I'm almost certain you're going to agree with me, but we'll see, is that basically my goal is... Do not use the algorithm. Don't trust the algorithm. Uh, and so I've now, this is already for a while now, I do not use Amazon to store the books that I want to buy. 
I create my own separate list and I want to look through that list. I don't want to Amazon using that information, deciding what to throw up for me. I need to separate myself from that. And what I learn from you now is that's the same with movies. Don't even use the list that they create in Netflix. Use a different list of the movies that I want to watch because they are manipulating me. And maybe, you know, I'm not sure that I am familiar with the algorithm, the way it relates to me. But maybe you can tell me your relationship with the algorithm of Netflix and other. I don't use algorithms, um, mostly because Netflix doesn't have everything or close to everything. And uh, I like falling down rabbit holes. I like reading uh, an interview with someone that I appreciate or that I follow and then just saying, seeing that he just watched something or read something that I'm not familiar with and then just kind of following the thread. They're, but just to be clear, they're rabbit holes of your making, yeah. not rabbit holes of Netflix or YouTube's or Amazon's making. Yeah, I mean, it's very rare that... I fall upon something, you know, uh, by chance on Netflix. I mean, if there's something new coming out that that's interesting to me, then I know about it and I'm, I'm going to make a point of watching it. But I'm very rarely surprised by uh, Netflix's uh, recommendations. And I'm, I'm mostly disappointed and kind of frustrated by the way it, it works because a lot of times things are just hiding, you know, they, they kind of hide their good stuff and they don't kind of suggest that you watch it they kind of they have this, these lists of things that are that are uh, put at the forefront but uh, i don't think it's anywhere near being uh, perfected these suggestion machines or whatever you want to call them because it, it'll always be more interesting when i initiate these chains like one thing leads to another and it'll always have a different feel to it and a also a different value. So you were telling me earlier how the algorithm for Netflix and for YouTube and probably other services is basically to whatever it takes to maximize the customer's time inside the app or inside your properties. But I want, I want, the, I want to customize the algorithm in which the algorithm says to me, based on your YouTube video watches, it seems to us that you're kind of a left-wing kind of guy. And would you like to see some right-wing kind of things? Or would you? are you feeling right now like you want to have your views reinforced? Or would you like your views challenged? You know? Or, you know, so, so the algorithm could actually, first of all, be like a human and reflect back to us what our preferences are. And why can't, why can't you or I go to the algorithm in Netflix and say, please Netflix, show me things that other people haven't seen that are highly rated by film critics, for example. It doesn't, you don't have any of that, do you? You don't. So you, you told me, and this is where we get hopefully to the part of our conversation where you actually prepared. <laughs> Not that that makes any difference. You're saying that the world has changed a lot in the last year. Yeah. Tell me how you see, you've seen it changed from the universe that you look at? Well, first of all, I, I'm, I'm a film critic. I write for uh, a daily newspaper in Israel, and I've been writing about movies for the past 20 years, and uh, I think this is, has been the craziest and most fascinating and uh, most tragic year for me uh, since I began working in this field. Uh, first of all, all the movie theaters were closed, uh, they've been closed for, for a year now, exactly a year. They've, they've opened again here in Zurich and Switzerland just for a little bit in the summer, but they closed again. In Israel, they've been closed all year. And uh, so that's the first dramatic difference. Uh, my, my office, my workplace has been shut down. Uh, movies haven't been shown in movie theaters uh, at all. And a lot of things that were like a lot of tectonic shifts or cultural shifts that have been like in the making that have been waiting in the wings for the last five years at least have kind of sped up and like they've happened within weeks and months. And there's been a huge shift from theatrical distribution of movies to streaming, to, to TV, to Netflix, to 
Disney now has a streaming service called Disney Plus, HBO Max, uh, Apple TV, Amazon, uh, all these uh, streaming services that are that have started something that's been named uh, the streaming wars, and all this is kind of wiped out movie theaters and and cinemas as I've come to to know and, and love it. So it's been really exciting to follow all this going on, like things that were deemed impossible uh, a year ago are now reality, you know, so it's, it's really crazy on one hand. On the other hand, it's really, really sad. I also kind of get the feeling that we're not going to get back the world that we had. It's not going to go back to normal ever. I mean, we're going to have like this new hybrid reality in, in the best case scenario where movie theaters will still exist at some level and most of the, most of you know the new stuff will also be on on TV and on streaming like at the same time. So I'm worried, basically. Funnily enough, and I, obviously I, I'm not a movie critic and I don't know as much about the medium as you do, but I'll just put back to you that very few people are going to invest. It's just expensive in the kind of sound and environment that creates a really really good cinematic experience. People watch on their phones. I know, but but um, watching on they call it the silver the, the big screen. The silver screen, yeah. The yeah. Big screen. There is a, it's just a completely different experience to be in that big screen, and it's a very very special experience. It's also a third place. It's not it's not your home, and it's a it's an evening out. I don't think that's going away at all. In the same way that um, movies didn't take away opera and cinema uh, and theater, so that's my view but maybe there'll be less of them i mean i think that there will be less first of all for sure there will be less and we have to ask ourselves what kind of uh, entertainments will be produced because everything is shifting and changing and that also applies to the types of of movies that will be made uh, the types of movies that will be released in theaters because this is what i what i meant when i said that things have kind of uh, taken on uh everything's happening at a faster pace Even before COVID struck, there was talk of of less artsy movies being released in theaters. I mean, most of the movies that have been released to theaters uh, before COVID were these huge superhero movies, uh, James Bond franchise kind of movies that can play all around the world uh, in the hope of uh, making a billion dollars. That's like... To, to succeed, you need to make like to have a, a bona fide box office hit. You need one billion dollars worldwide gross. So if you don't have a chance to make that that kind of money, then you'll you'll probably be released uh, to streaming services and not in movie theaters. And this takes us again to that list of a hundred best movies that you need to see before you die. How many of these huge blockbusters, $1 billion movies will be on the next 100 yeah. movies to watch before you die? Maybe a few, and, and I mean, if we're optimistic, but probably not a whole lot. But I'll tell you something that I've really liked about the development of streaming services, primarily Netflix, actually, is that you started to get uh, these series that were shot for, you know, so much of what was produced was basically for the national audience, Mm -hmm. primarily the American audience. And so they would have to pick American actors and American scenes and locations. And with the arrival of Netflix and a global audience, you get these incredible movies that take place across multiple cultures. Mm -hmm. So not that I've watched it, but Narcos, I think, was one of the first where you know, it's really special for me to see them using original language. So Spaniards speak Spanish because there's a big enough Spanish audience that they don't have to compromise and mm-hmm. force them to speak English. And they don't have to just pick locations that are familiar with an American audience because there's a whole Chinese and Asian audience that might be way bigger. And that must be so there's scale in other ways that has yeah. developed. And that yeah. must be nice. Um, yeah. We can talk about Spain, we can talk about North Korea, we can talk about Israel, we can talk about uh, Scandinavia, also as a hub of uh, plenty of popular TV shows in the last uh, 10 years or so. And it is nice to see that, like, the world is becoming smaller and that there is, uh, you know, you can, each country kind of has, like, its ambassadors doing work for it, you know, like North Korea, 
uh, it's been you know at, at the top of, of movies and, and TV for, for quite a while. Uh, last uh, year's Oscar winner Parasite is uh, not North Korea, sorry, South Korea. Okay. Uh, South Korea has been uh, really putting out lots of uh, interesting stuff. On one hand, it's really great and it diversifies uh, our options and whatever. But on the other hand, I again don't think that the algorithm or whatever is is doing good enough a job of helping you understand what's out there. I mean, if there is something that kind of uh, penetrates uh, the zeitgeist or something that people are talking about on Twitter for a few weeks, and you know, and you, and you understand, you you kind of see it pop up on your trending this week or whatever, then okay, then maybe I'll check it out. But there's so much stuff that we're missing just because, you know, it kind of falls between the cracks. And um, on the one hand, it's, it's very encouraging to see how stories can, can cross over between cultures. And it's really crazy to hear stories. There's this Israeli show that I know that you like, Fauda, that's been super popular also in Arab countries and uh, all over Europe, whatever, it kind of gives this kind of different uh, view of Israel and kind of uh, also allows it to, to be a part of, you know, this kind of action-adventure genre and like Tom Clancy and 24 or whatever, like, can, you can find, you can find uh, the way to put the Israeli-Palestinian conflict within, you know, the kind of borders of, of uh, narrative TV, like, and it's exciting and it's, it's also complex. I mean, if it would be stupid, I, I guess we wouldn't be talking about it like a few years after it was made, but um, yeah, there, there are plenty of options that, I mean, the, the worst thing that can happen is that we kind of forget what happened, like where we're coming from. You know, I think that's also what Martin Scorsese was talking about. He wrote an article that was published a few weeks ago in Harper's. The article was about Fellini and about what a wonderful director Fellini was and how you should really acquaint yourself with Fellini's movies. But at the same time, it's about how you can't acquaint yourself with Fellini's movies right now because none of them are on Netflix and none of them are on Disney Plus or wherever. And there are no video stores anymore, so I can't just walk into a video store. And, you know, basically, I think what he's saying is that if you don't go down these rabbit holes yourself, or if you don't have someone to, to show you these rabbit holes, or someone to kind of encourage you, and, I mean, the future won't be as good as, as it could have been, you know, if, if we would have kind of given... You know, there, there's movie, movies as art and movies as business, and in many cases, they go together. Like, Fellini was also a huge box office name in, in his day, and, you know, like, you, you can say Lynchian today, and everybody knows you're talking about David Lynch. It would also be the same regarding Fellini. Fellini was, was huge, and today, I mean, most young people don't have a clue who Fellini is, or your son, who was complaining about Rashomon. I mean, he also didn't know that Kurosawa was a major influence on George Lucas and Star Wars. So, I mean, all these things are connected, and, and someone has to really remind us of these connections. And this is, this is the value of, of like knowing what the mountain is made of, or what the building is made of, if, to bring us back to where we started. Yeah. It's good that you're able to tie what we're saying right now to what was being said almost an hour ago. Why why is it hard to find Fellini movies on Netflix? I mean, the, the guys... It's a matter who, of rights. So the guys who own the rights presumably want the movies to be watched. No, sometimes it's, it's worth more not to, to have the movies watched because uh, you hold on to the rights or you give them exclusively to, to a different streaming service or uh, you only have them on Criterion DVDs, which are these special editions. I mean, right now this is like the biggest blind spot of streaming services and I think that besides uh, Scorsese, I don't really hear anyone like of his stature talking about it, like the history of cinema is 
You know, movies before 1985 or 1995 or something are like, they're non-existent on, on these streaming services. And I'm not going to advocate for, for, for piracy. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if you're a cinephile and if you're looking to go down rabbit holes, that's the only route you have available to you. And I just will say that I did read an article a few weeks ago about how piracy is actually uh, turning into like to being this amazing positive thing because it's giving plenty of publicity to all these shows. It's, it's like even if I'm not uh, a paying member, a subscriber for Netflix or Disney or whatever, if I'm writing about their stuff and, you know, just like putting it out there on, on online and on social media, then... I'm doing a service for them, you know, even if I'm like stealing from them in parentheses. But uh, yeah, art house cinema is not uh, considered to be a good business. And as uh, a movie lover, I am, I'm worried that uh, like in 10 years from now, there will be very few movies a year that are really exciting and worth watching. I don't know. I really hope that that there will be a, a, a streaming service or some kind of section within a streaming service that is uh, that kind of recognizes the importance and also uh, the potential, I think. I don't think it, it should be viewed as like this snobbery or elitism. I think it should be seen as, you know, an exciting genre unto itself. You know, it's like these movies can change your life if you yeah. let them, you know. So I, you know, um, I like listening to classical music. I'm not an expert. Uh, I have, I listen to classical music on Spotify, but I also have a service called Adagio, and Adagio is wonderful. You can pick a particular work and find all the recording or all many recordings. And so you can compare different recordings. They will even, if you're interested, you know, you can t t pick a specific section of the music and find out how three different conductors and orchestras Played it so there is at least in streaming music and that's a specialized service and it's not the only one there's another one that's coming out now uh, and I'm actually surprised that there isn't a streaming service for outhouse movies there are there are a few there's Mubi there's Criterion Channel but first of all they're almost non-existent in Europe where we are right now I don't have there there, there are they're irre irrelevant in Europe and I think that also in the States, they're, uh, they're very small and they're, they're, they don't have... I mean, if you want your movie to succeed right now, if you want an audience, then you have to be on Netflix. I mean, yeah. that's more or less... Uh, it goes without saying. And that's the way it's going to stay for the time being. I mean, there, there is no... I mean, there's plenty of competition, but no one is coming close to Netflix and Disney, which kind of control the whole field. And it looks like that's the way it's going to... St you be know, for a while yeah quite so, a while so to bring this to to a close you write for israel hayom yeah. so you know i should tell the listener that this is happening in not in your mother tongue yeah and um i mean we were talking about uh, sweden and other small countries but israeli movies and the, the cinematic industry i mean it's been a huge a huge revolution it seems to me because suddenly you can be an israeli you don't have to be Gal Gadot. You can be the star of Fauda, and you can you can have a global audience. I mean, that's really extraordinary. Israel used to be this minuscule market. And um, it's amazing, but it hasn't started. It, it started before. It started with this really new wave of cinema, which is basically just a new generation of filmmakers that started having huge success at film festivals and also um, commercial successes outside uh, outside of Israel. And it also kind of uh, spilled over to TV. And there are so many TV shows that are being remade and formats that are being done in other languages. Plenty of, of creative talents that are just uh, enjoying huge success uh, all over the place. And, and for me as an Israeli, I'm, I'm super proud. And I'm, I also think it's super important uh, that Israel gets represented uh, in, in all its... Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's such a complicated country yeah. and such a complex, uh, it's so hard to explain. But when you have so many diverse voices making these movies, it's the best way to show people what Israel is. And it's, 
it, it serves as like the best ambassador for Israel that you can ask for. It's uh, just these honest stories about human emotions and about everyday struggles and just like I think it does more than than so much so many other like uh, you know uh, propaganda or whatever it's just it just goes straight to your to your feelings and your emotions and your heart and uh, I've had fascinating conversations with people who had no idea about Israel I mean after they they were watching something and like it's like a door that opens. Uh... And I, I know that it's not your favorite choice for this example, but for me, I, I was, what was so much fun for me to watch Fowder is that for the first time in my life, I had a common cultural reference because I could give anybody Fowder to watch and I could help them to see instantly and emotionally that the situation when it comes to the conflict in Israel is complicated. There are no easy answers and it's so deliciously complicated and I love the fact that our hero in that uh, show falls in love with a Palestinian woman and it's complicated for her too. And I just feel like I'm convinced that that show is responsible for so much change in the Middle East. I think it's far easier for the UAE to sign the Abraham Accords because so many citizens of the UAE have now watched Fowder and they understand that it's complicated. Would you agree with that or? I don't know if I would go so far as, uh, as to say what you just said, but I would definitely say that cinema and, and TV are, I mean, it's definitely building bridges. I mean, it gives you something that you can talk about. I mean, it's the same with uh, Iranian cinema that was very popular in Israel uh, over a long period of time uh, where you can kind of find, you can find common ground. You can watch, uh, or a Turkish movie for that matter, uh, and you can say, wow, that's, that's so much like, like Israel also. I mean, just to look at and also uh, to listen to and the things that, I mean, the problems these, these people are having and just to, to have these uh, points of uh, comparison and, you know, it's not like you read about it in the papers and it's, it's basically just people trying to touch you, using stories, trying to, to move you emotionally and it all goes back in the end to, to also what we were talking about in the beginning, like you, you, you were talking about the guy from Fauda falling in love with a Palestinian woman, and you know I, I'm immediately thinking about Romeo and Juliet. So it's it's always the same stories over and over again, just told from from different perspectives and different you know. It's amazing because it's only in this moment that I realize that the the love story in Fauda is actually of a, it's Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> It's just, it's incredible. Now, when, when you, as a movie critic, watched Fowder and you saw the romance developing between the Palestinian and the Israeli, how long into it do you become aware that this is the Romeo and Juliet archetype? Or do you get to it during watching? Or It depends, but I mean, it's always, it's almost always a variation on something that's very rare. <laughs> to see something yeah. new, but that, that I mean, as long as it's 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 well done, that it doesn't really matter. For what it's worth, I, I went on a wine tasting in Burgundy, and an expert in wine was leading us through. And he he said something which I'm sure you'll identify. With. He that he said, "Look, I'm now doing this because we're tasting the wine together, and I'm doing it critically." He said, "I don't do this when I'm hanging out with friends because that's no fun. I just drink the wine and enjoy it." So. There's the analysis of, for example, saying Romeo and Juliet, but actually you can just hang back and enjoy it and think about that maybe later. I'm going to throw you a curveball last question, <laughs> which you, you'll you be completely unprepared for, but that's okay. So, so don't freak out. <laughs> but there's, so I, I don't fully understand his work. There's a guy called Leo Strauss that many of my friends at university were very impressed with. And if I understand the little I know of him, he writes about how, in many ways, art is better when it's produced in circumstances of low freedom, 
because the artist is forced to express deep truths about society in a way that doesn't get him into prison. And so, you know, there's a kind of, they will seek a way to play a joke on the regime and the artist has to communicate to the audience in such a way that the audience knows what the, the artist is doing, but the regime can't nail them for it. And just to give you one example, to give you, to give you an opportunity to listen rather than talk, uh, is that uh, this happened in South Africa during apartheid. So uh, there were songs that black uh, housemaids would sing in the homes of these white women in which the words of the song are in, uh, you know, in not English or Afrikaans, and they're singing about how the revolution will come. So the housemaid is quietly working in a white woman's home singing. It's like deeply subversive and delicious from the perspective of the artist and the critic. And it came up for me because you talked about Iranian cinema, and I understand that Iranian cinema is full of that. Is it possible to produce great art in, in like, if, if, if the, you know, so just to just work that idea a little bit more, as I understand it, the, the, the pearl that is produced in the oyster is produced because a piece of sand goes in and irritates the oyster. And the pearl is actually the product of irritation. In a world in which we have so much freedom, how does art get created if maybe it needs to be created in conditions of adversity? Well, there are examples uh, for either approach. I mean, uh, you write about uh, Iranian movies. Uh, I can also think of Russian movies and Chinese movies. I really don't know. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, how does, how does art, how is art produced without these struggles? I guess the struggle is, is either within the artist or, um, I don't know, maybe it's also... It's devoid of struggle in a way. I mean, it depends what you're going for, I guess. I wrote one book, nonfiction, sort of memoir type book. There's no doubt in terms of uh, sitting and writing stuff, the most difficult thing that I've done. Extraordinarily painful. Uh, in fact, something that I wouldn't want to repeat. And I had this view of, you know, Thomas Mann, whose book I happened to be working my way through that for him it's easy. And then I realized, and I think this is true, but tell me what you think, that actually every person who creates anything that is worthwhile goes through pain to do it. And uh, actually somebody like Thomas Mann or James Joyce or other great writers and probably movie directors as well, they're just willing to live in great pain as they produce these works. And first of all, so it's a two-part question. One is, is that true for you? And second of all, if it is true, why would anybody do that? <laughs> I'm sure it's true for many, many uh, artists. I wouldn't say all artists, but for many artists. For me personally, I mean, I'll also add that I, I've never met a writer that said that he likes to write. I mean, right. I, yeah, on the contrary, I mean, I've... I've interviewed quite a few writers that I admire, that I, that I really even worship, and none of them told me that it's an enjoyable task to look, looking at a blank page, uh, yeah, but you do it anyway. For me, personally, maybe the most difficult thing to do, or one of the most difficult things to do, but I can't think of anything that's more enjoyable, ultimately, than... Uh, completing a work, whatever. I mean, for me, it's, it's basically writing songs. But for this question, it can also be like an article or a review of, of, that I'm proud of, you know, or whatever, that I feel that I kind of said what I wanted to say, you know, in a, in a competent way, <laughs> yeah. in an enjoyable way to read. Yeah, but it's a great feeling to, to express yourself in a way that is that you find accurate, that you find relatable, that you find, uh, you know, it's like a diary entry that isn't your diary, you know, it's uh, like a collective diary in a way, I mean, if, if it's a successful uh, piece of work. And I don't know, I find that very, very uh, satisfying, personally. 
I think that I, I'm struggling a little bit with um, the pain of creating something. I had an interesting conversation with somebody who said, you know, he, he felt like he wasn't a writer because whenever he sat down to write, uh, it wasn't an enjoyable process. And he, the people he was talking to said, well, if you don't enjoy it, stop doing it. And I actually, it was amazing. I feel like I opened his mind because I said, it's not supposed to be enjoyable. The fact that you're in pain as you started to write is actually a sign that you were doing something significant. The people who sit down and write and find it easy aren't being challenged in any way, which is just an interesting thought. It's, it's so much fun to talk to you. We could go on for hours. I feel like, especially having put you in a situation of some stress at the beginning of this conversation, is there anything that, as we talk right now, that's come up for you during the conversation that you feel like you want to kind of get onto this conversation before we bring it to a close? Um, no, just try to be optimistic and try to finish our conversation with, uh, you know, just hoping that we'll get to see movies in movie theaters again. If not uh, within the next few months, then during 2021, hopefully, and uh, that the world, the new world, the world after COVID, uh, won't be all that different. Will be just just a little different, not not totally different. The almighty algorithm uh, should should have its limits and should not be allowed to kind of uh, eclipse everything that's been built and created over. A century of, of movie making, of uh, audiovisual entertainment, whatever you want to call it. There's a history, and there's there's plenty of enjoyment and and fun to be had. And we're not done with it yet. And uh, Netflix is not uh, the answer to everything. So first of all, what we have not covered at all in this conversation is Yishai's music. So Yishai has a Spotify channel. He's also on YouTube, and you know I've been talking to you about your expertise in cinema, really, but you are also a songwriter. Yeah. And, and so uh, if people want to find your songs or also want to find your writing uh, and, or, and or want to get in touch with you, we'll certainly have it in the show notes, but why don't you tell them? where to find you and how to get in touch with you. Uh, well, it's, it's good that it's going to be in the show notes because my name isn't, isn't very catchy, but uh, Ishai Kichales. <laughs> uh, that's that's uh, how you can find it on Spotify and on YouTube. Yeah, And I write for Israel Ayom. If you don't read uh, Hebrew, you can use Google Translate. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you, Yishai. I really appreciate you coming in and talking to me. It was a pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me, Guy. And it's also, I really appreciate your willingness to educate me uh, because people like me need education. I also think that the world is not complete when people like me who spend most of our lives thinking, as you said, in numbers, don't attempt to think about the world through other perspectives. I think that's enriching. And I would tell the listener that Charlie Munger says he doesn't read fiction. I think that many, in all sorts of areas, Charlie Munger's right, but I think that he's wrong there, and I think that reading fiction should be an important part of anybody's reading diet. So, thank you. Thanks, Guy.